I just like to say, to say um, state my um, I'm very been very quite impressed by Hezbollah's professionalism in the in the field compared to a lot of the FSA militants that I have seen be here for a job, um, and compared to Hezbollah's tactics and how they um, perform uh, military wise, there is a huge disparity between Hezbollah and whatever the Turks, Saudis have thrown at Syria. And that is one of the reasons why they are doing very well. And that is one of the reasons why the West tries to demonize them every single time they are brought into the media. And I'm just curious what you said. They're just very good point of course. Thank you. Uh, this is just uh, another short commentary, and I'm just um, adding on to uh, Dr. Jalou's excellent presentation. Um, he mentioned the town of uh, Kamishli, um, which was now uh, predominantly a Kurdish city. Um, it's also worth noting that that particular town was actually established by Assyrian uh, refugees and survivors from the genocide. Yeah. And then just another note from his presentation is that he talks about the Western Arameans in the Kalamur Mountains. And just to add on from, from what he said, very excellent, um, that the mythology behind that particular language is that it's supposedly meant to be the same language that uh, uh, was spoken at the time of Jesus Christ and that what Jesus Christ spoke about. So just emphasising that, that's another language group that's on the um, cusps of um, extinction. Um, thank you very much for that, Paul. Um, the whole, uh, just a comment on the whole thing about the language of Ma'alula. But the Aramaic of Marwa is not identical to Palestinian Jewish Aramaic from the first century BC, which is what Jesus would be speaking, or Galilean Aramaic, you could say. Um, it's from the same language group, but it's not the same. It's probably closer than the Aramaic that the Assyrians speak. Um, but yes, thank you very much. It actually was established by Assyrian refugees from the genocide. Thank you for that. Thanks. Uh, this is just more of a statement. I just feel like after uh, hearing a couple of the speakers, we tend to forget about the um, the role that Hezbollah has played throughout. And I think the Battle of Kalamun was really a significant role that men decided to push through. So I think that when we are speaking about the war in Syria, we should really touch on the work that the other that our other allies are doing. So it's not just Syrian Arab Army; it's Syrian Arab Army and so forth and so forth. So I just want to make that that. Way. I I just like to ask the last presenter uh, with our Sunni terrorist groups, for example, um, if this was approaching, a local Sunni think, might think, "Oh, I'm going to be with that with that person because he is Sunni and she's." A person in the Islam Shia, so it doesn't that, like that might increase sectarianism, because that's that's, that's what also happened in Iraq, in Mosul, uh, when the army fled, they thought, oh, this, this person ISIS is Sunni, so I'd rather support him than a majority Shia army. So I'm just I just want to. Thank you for your question. That's, that's a very legitimate question to to be asked, and then he's answering, I could uh, tell you why what is happening in Syrian villages when they are being liberated, they are being liberated with Hezbollah fighters alongside the Syrian Arab army. The Syrian Arab army that represents uh, the Syrian government. So when an uh, assault is taking place against a certain village where Al-Qaeda affiliates or ISIS are residing, basically when these assaults are ground man to man, there are no civilians. That's not one. There are all uh, terrorists fighting in the face of the army in that area. But if in the case of a bombardment, for example, preparing for an assault, yes, there might be some certain uh, fellows or groups or people who are besieged in the area that would say, no, I will defend, it is uh, Shia against Muslims, it is etc., etc. That's because of the mainstream media propaganda that was happening in that area, uh, despite the fact that we saw what happened in Ma'amula after the liberation, we saw what happened in Gaza, we saw what happened in other areas as well, where Hezbollah was uh, present at the liberation, uh, at the contrary. Last uh, Sunday was Palm Sunday, Good Friday and uh, Easter, and people went back to their villages and were uh, praising the Lord after their churches were uh, abolished by these terrorists. Now, 
what will happen in that case, and that case basically after the assault is happening, after the terrorists are taken out, Hezbollah steps back and lets the Syrian Arab army go into that town and speak with the villagers, the villagers and speak with the civilians that are there, take the, the, the civilians out to refuge, to safe havens, and not Hezbollah for that specific reason that you are talking about. And could I just ask the second speaker why you disagree with the minorities having a sub area of self-determination? Wouldn't, wouldn't that help if they were able to have their own part in a federal federal Syria? Um, it would only help the imperialists to divide and conquer the country and to uh, basically steal the resources, to divide the majority population centers from the richest resource areas. I mean, the thing. The things that they're talking about dividing, which I discussed in the morning, um, the Kurdish region has much of the oil of Syria. It has a lot of the agriculture of Syria, and that oil and agriculture is there to feed 22 million people, not 1.2 million people. And uh, they were also talking about cutting off the um, Alawite region, which is supposedly the coast. And basically, the, the purpose of that is to create a landlocked country. Um, it's to make sure that Syria will no, have no agency in the future and to keep these religious groups fighting alongside each other permanently. I mean, again, you know, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about um, dividing uh, America up into different regions where black people are in one area, white people are in another area? Wouldn't that be better? I mean, if we talk about that, that would just be considered racism. So why are we talking about it in the context of Syria? And the only reason we are talking about it is because Imperialism is imposing this on us. And we are only, I want to add something, we are only talking about this right now, because right now is when the Syrian Arab army, along with the allies, are supposedly gaining over the terrorists in the major areas. That's why right now, just before the Syrian Arab army was to be engaging in their resort and in Raqqa, we saw the U.S. coming as the global police and say, stop, we will do that, and our friends will do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but isn't, if you're talking about imperialism on Syria, isn't Syria itself uh, imperialism, imperialist construction by the French? Because Iraq was as well, because before 1920s and 30s, Thank you, for that. you didn't call yourself Syria. But it's, it's the same narrative we hear from Israel. You know, your borders are fake because of sykes Pico. The reality is that Syria has existed for thousands of years. I can, as I showed you in the map, from um, 1,000 years before Christ, there was Syria. The, it was named Aram at the time, but then when the Roman Empire came in, they renamed the exact same region of land, exact same people, Syria. And we know it's the exact same people because the cities of Syria have been continuously inhabited for thousands of years. Syria has existed longer than any of the European countries and has more right to exist and more history behind it than any of the European countries. So to claim that Syria is somehow like a, a construction of imperialism. On the contrary, sykes Pico actually sought to divide Syria further, but the Syrian people resisted this. this. The reason why Syria isn't now cut up into several pieces is because in the 1930s, people like my own grandfather, people on the street, went out from every sector of society and fought what they saw as an imperial threat against the Syrian state and the Syrian people, who are some of the oldest people in the world. Hi there. Um, my name is Scott. I'm from ontheground.com.au. I'm a blogger that uh, provides alternative media uh, for people who are sick of the silence in the mainstream media that you talk about. What I want to ask is, are there any recommendations from all, all these speakers of any alternative media that people here can, can access that has English uh, translation in English uh, subtitles if needed, like what you presented? Yes, uh, I can uh, personally uh, recommend for you 21st Century Wire, uh, Masdar News, I can recommend For Truth uh, as well, I can recommend uh, Mint Press News. All of these have thousands of followers on social media and they have shown credibility because they are talking with people right there on the ground and I, I, I emphasize on Masdar because my friends as well uh, work there and I know that when they bring the breaking news they are the first people sometimes even faster than our uh, media and, and the Middle East. So I'm happy to give you the list later on again. Um, and in terms of uh, minorities in Syria, I would, well, 
straight off the bat. Uh, I would think of uh, any Armenian uh, news agencies. They're pretty reliable when it comes to their uh, affairs in their diaspora countries, whether it's in Syria, Iraq, or elsewhere. Um, as for Assyrians, there's the Assyrian International News Agency, AINA.org, and they provide a lot of contradictory information to what the media is feeding from various Kurdish groups, etc. Follow my channel. <laughs> no, Hi, for the third speaker. Um, I've always understood from my reading in mainstream media that the the, uh, the Sunni Daesh organisation They're not Sunni. They're not. They're Wahhabi. Okay, sorry. Uh, arose out of the um, Iraqi army that disbanded after the invasion of 2003. In Mosul, yeah. Um, However, you've linked them with the Israelis. I don't understand how that works. I, I, I understand, I've always understood that Daesh or ISIS or whatever you call it, their command and control structure arose out of Iraq. the uh, soldiers that were disbanded after the, um, the, the Iraqi army that was disbanded. After the posts in Mosul, that was Daesh. What about this stuff? Saddam's old. Yeah, Saddam's old. Ah, 2003, not 2014. 2003. No way. Really. by the United States when they invaded. That's not correct. But that's, uh, you're, you're talking about Al-Qaeda, not ISIS. Right. Yeah. And there is some information the question? Say, saying that ISIS died in like 2006, but it didn't have any land. It was started more just like uh, social media. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a part of Al-Qaeda. Yeah. But not in 2003. But that was but the the invasion. It, it no, he, he but it's not to do with the Iraqi yeah, yeah, army. He wants to link, he, he wants to say yeah. that the, the uh, the uh, Saddam revolution in Gaza, which is they, they, uh, they were wiped out, not wiped out, they were hidden out, no. and uh, after they also, after they took the Mosul, so they, they infiltrated the ISIS, so they become themselves ISIS. Yes. But they, they are just one part of them. Well, I, I'd, I'd like to ask you then a question. Where was the so-called uh, freedom fighters of the US when they allowed that to happen? I'll answer that. They allowed that because they supported that, they aided they that, up. they Simple. trained them, they, yes? They packed up. <laughs> that's Simple. your word for it, that's Sorry, the scientific word for it. And right. in the end, in the end, they allowed them also to infiltrate not only uh, Iraqi land, but also uh, Syrian land. So basically, this has not been the plan of the imperial colonial powers in the Middle East. That would not have happened. And that did not even start with Saif It goes back to 1907 for the conference of Bannerman and Campbell. I advise you to read about this, how they chose the Middle East, why they chose the Middle East, and how they chose to uh, impose uh, a body. They didn't say Israel. Israel came later on. They had to impose a body in the middle of the Middle East to break it and do what they are doing now. I just, uh, I want to point uh, regarding uh, the origin of ISIS. Uh, apart from the ideological origin, uh, ISIS itself, uh, Islamic State in uh, Iraq and uh, Syria or <coughs> Iraq and Lebanon, uh, however, uh, it's smaller organization in my research I found is Islamic State in Iraq. Mm. Then it's expanded. We don't know the Lebanon, not only the Lebanon, it includes uh, not only Syria. Not only Syria. And this is a confusion in this, uh, in this term because Lebanon is Syria, Lebanon, mm -hmm. Jordan, Jordan and Palestine. 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 Yeah. Palestine. So this is uh, the origin is uh, Islamic State of uh, in Iraq and it used to be under the uh, American occupation, after the American occupation uh, to uh, Iran. If I make, and make one yeah. sentence, just one sentence, the I, I, I it was. 2006 and was a Saudi operation and it was basically okay by the US because it divided what was left, anything left of a united Iraq that could uh, form a unified non-sectarian front against the occupation and to try to basically divide and conquer Iraq and push forward a civil war. Um, in 2004 both the Sunnis and the Shiites were standing up to the occupation and then you had all these market bombings and the ISI uh, being born, and we had um, the US actually getting Baghdadi out of, you know, Abu Dhabi prison. And obviously, this is all part of the agenda. It's all divide and conquer. Um, if I could just add something to this uh, conversation, 
I know Jay wants to, to add something as well. Um, look, I, I uh, know that in 2003, when the uh, US intervened, that's the official terminology, they intervened in Iraq, um, they basically disbanded everything. They disbanded the military, they disbanded the police, they disbanded all government institutions, all government workers were told to go home. All uh, people that were affiliated with the previous ruling party, the Ba'ath Party, were sent home. And when you are forced to um, go from being in a situation where you're only earning a little bit of money to earning completely nothing and being completely unable to provide for your families, a lot of people basically became desperate. Um, and they did see it as um, a lot of the people that were disappointed. Turn your microphone on, perhaps. Is it not on? Is my now it's not on. Now it is just speaking. <laughs> right, thank you. Um, a lot of the people that were seen to be disadvantaged were mostly from that ruling class of Iraq under Saddam, which were mostly Sunnis. Okay? And when the Americans came in and said, well, 60% of the population is Shiite, they need to have a say in how the country is governed, they need to be democratically elected, uh, that's when you started to see these grievances forming. Now, Jay, what was the name of that nationalist Iraqi group, uh, which was... Uh, you mean the, like, part of the resistance against... It was part of the... the Islamic the, Army of Iraq, uh, Naqshbandi Army... There was one that was secular. Oh, the 1920 the Revolutionary Brigades. The 1920s Revolutionary Brigades. Revolutionary Brigades. Um, there was actually a uh, part of the insurgency against the Americans that was nationalistic and secular. Um, but what we see eventually is the formation of something called the ISI, the Islamic State in the Iraq, which was the Al-Qaeda affiliate, which I think was led by Abu Musab al Zarqawi, and then it later expanded into Syria uh, with the Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, the Levant, okay? Um, and then that just became the Islamic State in, when was it, 2014, I think? Um, so it's, it's something that's, that's been growing, you can say, festering since 2003, and it's capitalized on people's grievances and people's misfortunes. Um, so, Jay? I just have one thing to say to the gentleman at the back of the leather jacket. There's an article by Seymour Hirsch. It's called The Redirection. It goes through um, how uh, Al-Qaeda actually emerged and, and the geopolitical function that it played. So Seymour Hirsch, The Redirection, I recommend that you read it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. We've got another question back here. Uh, I would like to direct to Ms. Os uh, Mrs. Osman. Uh, regarding, you say, uh, why America is not able to see ISIS uh, white uh, Toyota tracks? The white uh, convoys, yeah, the white Toyota convoys. Because their, their satellites are blind over Syria and Iraq, but when it comes to uh, Afghanistan, the cave system in uh, uh, Tora Bora, which ISIS is hiding in the cave system, their satellites suddenly become visible underground, <laughs> uh, underground. and they throw the, the biggest bomb, Ban uh, Banco Basta, which is orange color, was on the internet, to hit the uh, cave system to destroy it. They with a $340 million exactly. bomb. Exactly. <laughs> if they paid Bin Laden to build the caves with a D9. <laughs> I think ISIS originally came in from work faster. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was comment, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Look, this is a bit of a simple request, something obvious. But uh, you guys have been referring us to a lot of really interesting sounding articles and so on. And I'm wondering if they can all be links be loaded up onto the Facebook event, you know, so we can go back and go, ah, this is what she's talking about. Or this Great, we put that in this, and then we will get all banned from entering any... Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to... I was wondering... Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe we can put those articles on the CCAHS website instead of Facebook, and it might be a bit safer. Um, I was going to say, can you, any of you expand a little bit, in, you know, briefly, on the role of the U.S. in kind of well, what the history of the relationship with the U.S. slash Israel and the intelligence services with um, Al Baghdadi when they first became aware of him, and what was you know, you know, when he was in jail, I think they they knew him all through that time, and they 
arranged for his release or what happened? So I've read a little bit about it, but I can't remember too well. I Someone know it? can answer that too. Um, I read that basically other inmates of Abu Ghraib said that he got special treatment, <coughs> that he was often taken out uh, of the compounds and um, yeah, that he was basically in, you know, with the, with the U.S. And a lot of these um, Al Qaeda type people have had CIA connections for a very long time. What's it? And uh, if you, you know, since the, the war in Afghanistan, of course, Osama bin Laden had his CIA connections. And uh, if you had watched my, um, if you had been there in the morning when I discussed some of the stuff, I talked about some of the false flag uh, attacks that happened in Iraq with the British SAS that were dressed up as Arabs and bombing things. So, um, as far as I know, other inmates said that he had special treatment before he was released. Well, there's another question back here. Um, just to clarify, I have a theory about the inception of all these factioned uprisings. Um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I thought it was from the 1970s between the Soviets and the U.S. Uh, in the midst of the Cold War and the Soviets um, intervening in Afghanistan, uh, uh, overriding their government structure and obviously breaking that up and creating these uprising factions, including the Mujahideen. And the U.S. has been funding the Mujahideen since the 1970s. <coughs> Correct me if I'm wrong because you guys are still talking about the 2000s, um, if it wasn't happening since the 1970s, or was it? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the 1970s was basically when they created Al-Qaeda and put into power the Taliban. Although the, the um, Afghan government requested Russian help with what was an Islamic um, jihadist insurgency that was being fueled by Kissinger, I believe it was. Yeah, right. Carter and Brzezinski. Right, but even though they requested um, Russian intervention at some point, the Russians did intervene and crumbled their government structure twice. No? Uh, in with Amin no uh, and then before him, Tariqi? Uh, no, the Russians actually backed the governments, um, three different governments yeah. during that time. Um, and the Mujahideen was actually funded by the US at the time in the 70s. Um, Al Qaeda was never actually seen. There's no visual existence of it. It's only been referred to till date. Um, but, yes, I will. Sorry, 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 Al-Qaeda was the name of the CIA database. Yes. 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 So there's no physical proof of what Al-Qaeda is. It's like a combination of different factions. Al-Qaeda was, was basically un understood to be like a network that operated globally in order to attract foreign fighters so they could be sent to Afghanistan. Um, the Soviet Union actually intervened to intervene at the request of the Afghan government. They requested 11 times for assistance before any assistance came. Um, but then what happened was there was there was a factional fight between the the Kalk and the Parcham faction of the Communist Party, and that resulted in um, in the Parcham faction ending, ending up taking power. Um, but that's only because but that's the Soviet Union didn't have too much to do with that. Um, it, well, I mean I shouldn't say that the uh, Hafiz al Amin was assassinated uh, by by uh, Soviet Spetsnaz. But that's because his faction was busy purging and killing lots of Pacham faction members. But that's like, you know, really getting into minutia. Ultimately, you know, the USSR intervened to defend the Afghan government against the forces of, you know, misogynistic, uh, like, uh, Islamist reaction that were waging war against the state. You see the, the outcome of the state having been overthrown in 1992, the Taliban eventually taking over. Uh, okay. Uh, um, another question here. Um, <clears throat> hello. Um, I think we see that in a room full of people obviously very interested in the subject and a lot of them are obviously quite knowledgeable, that there are a lot of contradictory opinions and misunderstandings and this is why it's so difficult to get some kind of common narrative that common ground that everybody can agree on. And especially as the mainstream media fractures and splinters and disintegrates and therefore there are more voices on the internet but they're not united, they're, they're more disparate. This is one of the reasons why I think it's going to be more difficult and more to find common ground, but that's a negative. And also the fact that, uh, uh, just coming on from Iraq, I think you're giving too much credit to uh, George Bush and people like Paul Bremer and uh, you know, Paul Wolfowitz, etc., you know, about the fact that they were you know, constructing this great conspiracy to, to fracture Iraq. 
I think they wanted to have it as a shining beacon of uh, secular democracy, but of course, they, as the gentleman said, they probably fucked it up in uh, the application process. But anyway, I just wanted to, what to ask you about. There's a problem at the moment, and you mentioned um, salt and Erdogan. <laughs> um, the, the problem is that there's a tendency within Middle Eastern governments to the strongman dictatorial government, especially in times of crisis, and we're seeing, I mean, we've had supposedly a lot of Kurds voting for Erdogan, which is unbelievable, um, because obviously he's promised them something. Um, but, you know, you saw that with Assad, obviously, this tendency to almost dynastic succession because they're trying to protect their own faction. And what happens, and we see this in many other countries, we saw it in Sri Lanka with the Tamils, where they thought they were being discriminated against uh, economically and politically, they didn't have enough say in the government, which is why they developed resentments and then eventually turned to a military conflict. And uh, this was what happens, and this is what the Arab Spring in the common uh, narrative is, that there was a lot of disgruntled young men in particular who, for whatever reasons, picked up the wind of what started in Tunisia, for whatever reason, and then went through Egypt and, and the rest of the Middle East to the point where they all say this is the time to throw these guys who are kicking us out of our rightful you know, investment and share of the joint fruits of these countries that we live in. So I just wanted to, to comment on whether you see that as a major problem because of this level of corruption and nepotism that seems to be inherent and what you think you can do about it in the current context without complicating what's going on even further. Well, I could give you the question, but I just want to say one thing. I think you're giving Bush and Bremer too much credit when you say that they intended to make Iraq a secure democratic state. <laughs> certain rogue uh, uh, regimes and the states, certain deep states that are um, basically just uh, uh, tormenting the people, making them, pushing them into appraisals. We all want an appraisal. I am from Lebanon. Well, trust me, I don't like any politician. They are all rogue. The fact that who put this politician in, if, uh, these politicians in, in their place, we have to go back to the constitution. So actually, wrote the constitutions for the Arab states, if there are any Arab states. After that, by writing the constitutions, who was giving money to these people in power? Don't, I, I'm not going to believe that we have uh, Arabs who made uh, money because they were inherited. They, they inherited the money. Well, not even the Saudis inherited the money. They stole the resources of the people of Hijaz. The resources belong to the people. They do not belong to one. They belong to everyone. So basically, who wrote these constitutions? Who made it possible for these politicians to become in power and stay for more than 42 years like Mubarak in power and then in eight months, oh, he's a dictator. Off with his head. So basically, yes, the, the, the dictators, yes, the regimes, yes, they need a lot of uh, improvement. That's why we saw reforms, in, just like um, Maran spoke about the reforms of 2012 and 2011 that no one spoke about inside of Syria. Because why? Because now, no, 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 Bashar al-Assad is a genocidal maniac, he should off with his head. The big example for the democracy of America in Africa is Idi Amin, who was supported by the United States. Okay, we've got another question over here. Hi, um, I just wanted to find out um, how, how much confidence is there among uh, the quote-unquote secular forces in Syria about the secular intentions of what is essentially a religious organisation in Hezbollah. There is no Hezbollah in Syria. Uh, is uh, part of the government in Lebanon since 2005, right? I'll tell you something. Hezbollah does not even, did not even have part in the government in 2005 despite the fact that they were initiated in 1982. They did not have any hand in the civil war. They liberated the land. They pushed out the Zionists. They didn't take power. Tell me about any resistance that have never claimed power after such an event. 
Well, they did it. Why? Because Lebanon has 18 sects. Lebanon, this tiny country, has 18 sects. If one sect is to take power over the other, we go back to the civil, to the civil war. I'll give you evidence. Now we are fighting inside of Lebanon to try and change the uh, electoral law inside of the country to change it to, to a person type law, not a secretarian uh, law. Hezbollah, the Shia resistant movement, the movement that is for the wilaya, the movement that follows the uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. It is the only group, I'm talking about facts, it is the only group inside of Lebanon that is pushing for a full percentage electoral law while its allies, the allies of Hezbollah, are refusing. How can Hezbollah be a danger or a risk for a secular Lebanon if it is the sole group that is defending the secularization of Lebanon? I'm talking about Syria. Okay, how did that happen? But in fact, if that's happening in Lebanon, why should it be any different in Syria? Well, I don't know. I had well, no idea. That's I, why I I'm guess asking. it's not hard as we see their behavior in Lebanon. We can be confident. But there's other things. Um, there are secular militias fighting in Syria, not just the government. You have the SSNP, you have the Ba'athist regimes, uh, Ba'athist regiments, sorry. <laughs> but they, they have their own agency, right? The, so the only secular groups are currently on Iran and Hezbollah's side. Hezbollah and Iran are on the secular group's side. We are the ones that are pushing this forward. I mean, Hezbollah cannot change the demographic of Syria. They cannot change the laws of Syria. They can only help us. So that even if they wanted to do anything, um, uh, non-secular in Syria, they wouldn't be able to because the Syrians are you know, going to accept it. I mean, Hezbollah is Lebanon. But how many how many fighters of Hezbollah are there? Five thousand compared to how many thousands of Syrian Arab armies? Hundreds. Why should that be any risk? Okay, we have another question here. Um, I wanted to address uh, uh, for one the dude Jack over there who was talking about. ISIS um, and why the allegations come up uh, and tying it to Israel. A lot of the allegations come up mainly due to the fact that uh, ISIS does not really attack Israel and has gone inside of Israel to launch attacks at Hamas. It doesn't really make sense. Plus, everything ISIS is doing is for the aims of Israel. And it's carried out um, pretty much for Israel. And to balkanize these countries, to destroy them, to stabilize them, um, and in the case of Syria, help uh, remove uh, Assad. And then I want to address this dude here, uh, who is asserting in the mainstream line that apparently Iraq, a country that was sanctioned, which starved to death 800,000 children, the United States wanted to use that as a shining beacon for the region, apparently. After starving to death 800,000 children, I don't think so. They don't give a damn about any country there. I'm sorry for getting heated, but I hear this all the time. They use it as an excuse. They use it as an excuse every single time this question comes up. They use it as an excuse. Sorry, we screwed up. They didn't screw up. It was written up in PNAC, the Chilcot Report. You can look at all of these countries have been lined up so that they can destroy them. And they destroy them for the aims of the APAC lobby. That's why they're doing it. They're doing it for the aims of Israel aims of big corporations for uh, money. The politicians vote on these wars based upon how much money is coming in and how much money in the checks are coming in. I'm not saying they're these wars, I'm just saying... These wars, yeah, but again, they're 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 to try and cover it up. It's to try and cover it up. The United States, the United States, the United States do not give a damn to a lot of people in the Middle East. They do not care. They bomb them every single day. Look at what they have done to Yemen. Look what at the irony, which is why you go. I don't just understand the irony somehow. Do I? When you kill millions of people, when you exile millions of people, and then claim that you care about them, that's that's irony. I think. Is it not? Is they're doing it for a political agenda? I was talking about Shani because I already came in. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just wanted to put forward. I won't comment on the variety of conspiracy theories that we've heard. What I would really like to know from the expert panel is what really differentiates 
the people of the Levant from each other? Are they not primarily and essentially one people? Thank you. I go back to 1907 conference of what? Campbell and uh, Bannerman. Campbell and Bannerman, they called for the European leaders, the heads of state of Europe, into a conference in Britain. And they sat them down at that conference and they told them, do you like the way that Europe is going? They said, no. They said, don't you want to stay the leaders of the world? They said, yes. What he did is he distributed maps in front of these leaders. The, the map was the map of the Middle East. He told them, look at these states. Do you know what these states have that we don't have? No one answered. He told them, first of all, they have good weather. They are situated in an area which is near to Europe, near to Asia, near to uh, uh, Eurasia as well. They all speak one language. They all have one religion. Basically, a major religion which is Islam, and they have other uh, minor, uh, minority uh, groups. And they all are willing to take over the world if they have a good leadership. Should we just sit down and wait for a good leadership to come, to take them into development, from development into knowledge, from knowledge into leadership? No, we shan't. What shall we do? They sat together and they figured out a plan. The plan was put out by Bannerman, said that we need to input uh, an, uh, an entity. He didn't say what entity, he said we need to input an entity that breaks this world apart. First of all, it should have three rules. The first rule is to break it east and west. The second rule is that it should have our backing no matter what, because we need to break them. The third rule is this entity has to work on breaking up the states and the unity of the states around it. They decided that, yes, we shall do that. Years later, Mr. Wiseman came along. Mr. Wiseman said, we have read the minutes of meeting of your conference, and we are interested in it. We have a solution for it. We are Jews. We don't want to give us land inside of Europe. We are ready to make that, take that, that land pinpoint where you want to break it, we'll take it. They pinpointed and said, we will get you evidence that we were historically from that land, despite the fact that they were white with blue eyes. We will get you evidence that we are from that land. That's what happened. This is how the Battle of War Declaration was created, and this is what brought Israel into our lands. You have now just given me a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Tell me about yeah. the people, their language, their culture, okay. and their okay. customs, and second. their people. This is a conference. Is that a conspiracy theory? Um, the Balfour, you can look at the Balfour Declaration in 1917. I asked, How is that a conspiracy I asked theory? about the people okay. and what differentiates them. Okay, I, can I did not ask what separated them. I, and you've answered well, you, what <laughs> separated them, well, in your view. None in my your, view, sorry, in historic, in historic I asked you what, what, so what, what they have in common, and I, I, I submit... I told you what they had in common, and why this common was a major risk for Europe, that is, hence, people why they invited it. Okay, okay, we have another, another question here. Yeah. Sorry, sorry could, I, could I make a response? Sorry, yeah. Okay. I don't think... You, you seem to be a little bit more intelligent, <laughs> sorry. Oh, 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 oh that didn't uh, work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if intelligence is for you by gender or by language or by race, then my friend, you have not even built yourself up to become you have a human. Not stronger. Um, now, to the gentleman. I'm going to disregard the comment that you just made to Marwa. Okay? I think that was very disrespectful. It had nothing to do with agenda. No, but still, to, to say that someone is more intelligent than someone else is, is quite uh, disrespectful. disrespectful. Definitely. 
Now, you asked the question about the people of the, of the Levant, and my paper basically focused on the different ethnicities, the different languages, the whole mosaic and gamut of peoples that live in the Levant. And if you want the truth, no. Not everybody in the Levant is the same. But there is a common thread of identity that has been present since at least the 19th century. Now we know that under the Ottomans and in the Middle Ages, there were no concepts of nations as states. There were concepts, however, of ethnicities and of religious communities and of ethno-religious communities. Okay? Now, the difference between an ethnicity and an ethno-religious community is that an ethnicity can be secular and can transcend different ethnic, uh, different religious communities. Now, in the 19th century, we see, for example, the first people to migrate to Australia, to America, from Lebanon, actually identified as Syrians. The first, the first... They don't now. Well, the first, the first Lebanese, the Tell first that to Lebanese my man, like, associations, let me finish. The first Lebanese associations to be established in Australia only began to be established after 1924 with the establishment of the state of Lebanon. Okay? And even if you look at records pertaining to the Maronite Church in Redfern, St. Maroons, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the records call it the Assyrian Church because there was an ambiguity between whether it's Syrian or Assyrian, and even in the alien registration certificates that were required of people from enemy countries living in Australia during the First World War, people from Lebanon and even Syria that registered would sometimes call themselves Assyrians, sometimes call themselves Syrians, and vice versa. Okay? Now, um, just to go back to Maram's comment on my paper, because I advocate for autonomous areas for the various ethnicities, it does not make them any less Syrian. Okay? Syria can be taken as a geographical reality, and it has been a geographical reality since Roman times. Okay? Well, since the breakup of the Seleucid Empire in the first century BC. So, what I would like to say is, because I advocate for autonomous areas, for different ethnicities, different religious groups, it does not mean that I advocate for a balkanization or a fragmentation or for a breakup of Syria or even of Iraq. We need to look at countries that have successfully implemented autonomous areas for their ethnic groups that have actually included them as their ethnic groups within the system, such as Russia, the Russian Federation, has autonomous republics, has autonomous districts, has autonomous provinces, including a Jewish one, yeah. uh, and then you have China. With China, the, the system is even more interesting, because in China you not only have autonomous provinces, uh, you have autonomous districts, autonomous sub-districts, autonomous lo localities, and even autonomous neighborhoods within cities. And I think that is a good model. Even though China has been seen to be authoritarian, even though China has been seen to be abusing minority rights, it's still a very interesting model. Because, let's face it, there were 1.5 million Assyrians in Iraq in 2003. Now there are less than 250,000. Okay? And the immigration to the diaspora is only going to aid in the loss of their language and the, loss, and the extinction of their culture. So I think urgent steps need to be taken to maintain the cultural diversity that exists in the Middle East without breaking up the existing states. This is a very important question. So Thank, you. Other Thank you very much for answering it. It's a very it important sense. subject. There, and that's an intelligent answer. The difference between the people oh I just I want him to refer to a creator of uh, a group is called SSNP. His name is Antun Saada. And he was um, a social you know, um, scientist. And he search and um, give you the full details about, they call it Syria, which included Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Iraq, Jordan, Jordan, Jordan. Jordan and Kuwait. All was one area. And actually, even I've got currency of Lebanon, they call it bank. 
Lebanon and Syria was one bank only, and Tripoli was only Tripoli of Sham, Tripoli of Syria, and Baalbek was a center for the Syria as well. They all in Lebanon. The all was one area. There is no border at all. But inside these people, they divided, they divided and gave and create a Lebanon state in order to make the people in this area weak and to control it through um, a group of religious. That's why they're going now to divide it, more divided, to make it more weak because of the resistance now coming, that resistance of creating resistance of Shia. Now, Excuse me, sir. Um, the Muqawma, sorry, um, the uh, Lebanese Hezbollah, and which including many not only Shia, including many uh, groups. So they want to make it weak. They want to create more religious you know, groups here and here and here. That's why they're playing now. Okay, so, so you well, also well, I would like to add to this, I'm sorry. In the Levant area, is that correct? Um, I mean, it's fine, I've got no argument with that. Folks, um, I would just, just like to say that, and I'd like the speakers to make some final comments on this. Okay. Okay. I'll just make a comment. La last comment. Um, there are far more unifying things about the people of the Levant than there are things that divide us. I mean, you could probably come up with things that would divide Sydney and Perth, but you'd probably find a lot more in common with them. Um, so, it's really a very similar culture, very similar food, you know, historic, we share the same history. Religion is one of the things that divides people, but it doesn't have to, because I'm from Damascus, and I live in, well, I used to live in Damascus, I live in a building with Christians, with Muslims, and unfortunately, in the past, you know, my grandfather used to live in Aleppo, where we had a big Jewish community, and he lived right there in the Jewish community. And they were his neighbors, they were his friends, and we didn't need autonomous regions for every part, because it didn't matter what you believe, at the end of the day, First we were Syrian. Yeah. But the, the, thing, the, the thing that broke us to begin with was the creation of Israel, and uh, unfortunately, this Zionism was fed, really, the purpose of it was to break, the, to, to, to create the first seed of sectarianism and entrench it in the Middle East. And the Jews of Europe were basically just exploited to that end. And that is, maybe you could call it a conspiracy, but if you look up the transfer agreement between the Zionists and Hitler, it's all very black and white. So. Okay, if I could just add something as a final comment. And then I'm going to hand over to Marwa. Um, first and foremost, yes, uh, maybe 50, 60 years ago, there was no need for minorities to have their own autonomous districts or neighborhoods or whatever. But what's happened since? The minorities have become ultra minorities. From numbering in the hundreds of thousands, now you only have tens of thousands or even thousands or even hundreds in some areas. And this needs to be reversed. Okay, sorry, I, I just want to, I want to clarify that, okay? The Middle, East lost, the Middle Eastern countries lost their Jewish communities after the creation of the State of Israel because of the antipathy towards Israel as being a Jewish state, and the Middle East shouldn't have to lose any of its other still existing religious or ethnic minorities that are indigenous and native to those areas. Secondly, to the gentleman uh, that mentioned uh, greater Syria, Surya Kuba, okay? Uh, let, me, let, me, let me just reiterate, okay? Just before I hand over to Marwa. Iraq was never part of Bin Sham. Iraq was always Iraq. And the Jazeera was always Jazeera, and Mosul was always Mosul, and they were never part of Sham. Not under the Umayyads, not under the Abbasids, and not under anyone else that followed them. Let, let me just finish. When you are talking about before, as easy. You are talking about the Seleucid Empire, and even before the Seleucid Empire, the first political entity to unite the areas from Iraq all the way to Lebanon and Palestine was the Assyrian Empire. And the word Syria comes from Assyria. So why call it Syria? Call it Ashur. <laughs> We have no problem what the name is as long as we all stand united and we stand in the same land as our forefathers. I just have to take one question from a very old friend. I have to. Thank you, Tom, for being here. Go ahead. Thank you to all the speakers as well. Um, I just wanted to 
wondered if all of the speakers might comment briefly on Russia's role in Syria as it relates to their topic. Okay, well, uh, I can... Uh, for example, how Hezbollah sees uh, Russia's... Well, uh, I can advise you to watch, the, uh, not the latest, the one before that. I can get you the date of the speech of Sayyid Nasrallah when you spoke about that in specific, because there were a lot of confusion concerning the role of the Russians alongside Hezbollah versus the uh, Israeli attacks where Russia just backs off and doesn't have any say in that. Well, he literally said what the, the group thinks by, uh, by asserting that... Hezbollah being an allied force to the Russian Air Force in Syria does not mean that they are allied forces in the Le uh, Lebanon, in the area uh, close to the uh, Palestinian, uh, the occupied Palestinian territories. He specifically said if we are allies there, it doesn't mean that we are allies here. So that's the Hezbollah uh, opinion. I could leave it to my uh, Syrian friends and the Syrian friends to talk more about uh, the role of Russia and Syria. I think it was just giving, giving you a final chance for a comment before we wrap up, because we do have to wrap up. Yeah. Okay. Any final comment you want to make? Uh, my final comments, I would like to thank you, Dr. Tim, for uh, giving us the opportunity to be here and to express... And I remind you to come back tomorrow. We've got the 9 to 5 session tomorrow too, but we do have to leave. We've run out of time, unfortunately. But plenty of time for discussion tomorrow. Thank you for coming.